I think what people know most about the bomb squad, if they know anything, is that we have robots. Uh, if two robots break, you call another team and you get a third robot and then a fourth robot. We, we had a rule that basically, you didn't put your foot somewhere unless the robot went there first. There's an old saying among bomb technicians, distance is your friend. We heard it a lot during a recent visit to a U.S. Army training facility outside Washington, D.C., where we got a robotic crash course in explosive ordnance disposal. But what does distance as your friend mean when there are lives, including your own, on the line? We went to Niagara Falls, New York, to meet Brian Kastner, a former bomb tech and author of The Long Walk, to find out. I was an Air Force officer for eight years, and then I moved over to the bomb squad. Uh, and then I did two tours in Iraq with the 101st Airborne uh, supporting the Kurds and being the bomb squad for a city of a couple hundred thousand, essentially. Well, on my second tour in Iraq, uh, over about six months, we did 800, 900 missions. And so out of that many missions, a good two thirds of them are going to be using the robot in some way. The U.S. Department of Defense began rolling out these small ground robots in the early 2000s. Today, two robotic platforms dominate every bomb tech's toolkit. There's the PackBot and the Talon. Both are fitted with cameras, an arm and a claw, and are operated remotely with video game style controllers. Bomb techs, we have the absolute best toys. I've seen a guy knock out the car window grab onto the frame of the door and lift himself, lift the robot, up inside the car, get in the front seat, and then start taking apart the device. That's what the PackBot can do. But the Talon is the workhorse. The Talon is the, it's the go-to, it's the tank. It busts through everything. It is nearly indestructible. I think when you start off, everything is just cool. It's cool that the robot does this thing. Eventually, the cool factor goes away and it's just another tool in your toolbox. We were so spoiled. We had this massive 47,000 pound truck and we could fill it full of millions of dollars worth of gear. We could take uh, all these different pieces of technology, but the main thing, like I say that everybody knows, is we have this robot and by 2006, 95% of the time, you'd have the robot there. In 2006, the Pentagon reported 3,000 improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, in Afghanistan, and nearly 31,000 IEDs in Iraq. Peak IED hit a year later, when Kastner was finishing active duty in Iraq, where 33,000 IEDs were reported. I sometimes think that especially, say, in the Iraq War. Each side sent their champion into battle. Their champion was the IED. And our champion was this robot. We had the two go and fight. When the war got started, we had so few robots that they were just really precious. When one blew up, it was out of the fight and it meant that you had to be doing a lot of this work hands-on. And so the robots were so precious, you really did protect them initially. The military couldn't provide solid data on the number of bomb robots deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan between 2004 and 2014. But a representative with the military's counter IED agency said the summary answer would be, quote, in the thousands. Eventually, we just bought so many of the things, they almost became disposable. And we would have a whole stack of blown up robots in the corner. And I love to see it. Every blown up robot meant that somebody lived. We did name some of our robots. We tended to give our robots names either of UFC fighters or porn stars, basically as a giant middle finger. I think that this idea of 
naming the robot and really growing attached to it and thinking of it as another person, another member of the team, that was really true when we had so few of them. And then eventually, we got an army of robots and, and we were able to, to maybe use them as they were really intended. The, the robots kind of transitioned you know, away from us. The last thing that you want to do is be laying on top of the bomb cutting the red wire. So we back up and we use a robot. And then we back up and use a drone. And then we back up again and we back up again and we back up. But sometimes you're still all the way right there. There is no worse feeling in the world than sitting on a road, checking it with a robot, saying everything is clear, packing up and driving away, and then seeing a detonation in the rearview mirror. Because you sent a patrol in, and you said the area was safe, and it wasn't. And then you're turning around, and you are. You're picking up pieces of the suicide bomber. You're picking up pieces of American soldiers. You don't use a robot to pick up pieces of people. You do that yourself. Even the distance provided by military robots doesn't shield soldiers and bomb techs like Kastner from the horrors of war. Do you have PTSD? No, I don't actually have post-traumatic stress disorder, but you can be plenty crazy and not have that particular diagnosis. It just means that in the manual where they, they look up these diagnoses that you have eight of the required 12 things or something. So I don't have enough of those. The most effective way to get past these things is forgetting. I did try a lot of things. Writing the book was my way of telling the story to explain what happened to me. But I did try yoga. I tried alcohol. I drank a lot. And if drinking had worked, I probably would have kept uh, drinking. I think it is the writing. I think writing gives you space to forget. Writing the book, I was really conscious of choosing to be a writer, wanting to do a good job and wanting to tell a story that other people might want to read. So all of my scribbled notes for my therapist. Do you miss the war? Oh, I miss it. Oh, I miss it a lot because time slows down and it's, it's peaceful in some way. You know that you're alive. I don't know if I miss the robots. I don't know if I miss the technology. I miss, I, I miss the guys. I love the men I served with more than the robots. Thank you.